Lagos State Commissioner for Education, Folashade Adifisayo, says the state government is currently engaged in talks with private sector organizations to provide one million digital services to aid the teaching of students in the state. Speaking at an interactive media briefing held at JJT Park, Alausa on Thursday, Adifisayo said the state government is also exploring the option of online classes for pupils across schools in Lagos to prevent a disruption of the ongoing academic session. According to the commissioner, discussion are ongoing with the bank as well as private education consultancy firms to teach students who are currently at home and prepare them for various examinations including the West African Senior School Certificate Examination. And joining us live from the school angle is Bolanle Adewole, a parent Daisy Jonathan community uh, to talk about the community aspect of it is Mudupe Odefa and the government aspect of it is Dotsun Akonde. Good afternoon you all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And it's good to have Thank all you. of Happy you. Us. All right. Very quickly, we'll begin with you, uh, Bolanle Adewole there. What have schools yes. been doing up till now? And what has, uh, what has the response been like so far? So the immediate thing we did um, after the directive to shut down was to migrate our learning onto the online platforms. So what we did was um, we immediately moved the curriculum, we adapted our curriculum, and we started to present to the children through virtual learning. The response has been mixed. We've had parents who readily um, embraced it, and we've had parents who feel that it is um, not suited to their children. So our school is an inclusive school. We, we work with ch typical children as well as children with special needs. Mostly for the typical children, it has been welcomed and it has been, it has been fantastic. But for the children with special needs, we've had a lot of challenges with their attention span and their ability to, to wait it out and sit down and absorb as much as um, the typical children. But by and large, it's been pretty much good. I guess the other challenge we've had has been with the fees. Um, we had a, a hard time trying to balance what we will charge for the online or what not to charge at all. You know, so um, those have been the challenges we've had. But other than that, it's been fine. The curriculum has been well received by the children. It is flowing appropriately and um, they are learning. All right. Very quickly make sure to that you. That, sorry, I have to interject. Yeah. So we all have time to speak to you again. What are the unique demands of special needs learning as opposed to mainstream learning? Okay, so the unique demands. Interestingly, last year on this same platform, we were talking about assistive technologies. Who would have known that it will become something mandatory within a short time because th that seems to be the only option we have at this point so with the children with special needs it's been more of their assistive technology we've um, made sure that their work is simplified so we've made it very practical very engaging we keep their lessons very short because of their attention span we've made them predictable so um, everything is ordered in a way and it's sequenced so it's following the individual plan but at the same time sequenced to meet their needs in that way. Other than that, um, it's, it's been wonderful, but um, we still have the little challenges, but the unique needs are just making sure that it meets the needs of every child, which has not been quite easy, but it's been achievable. We've, we've been working towards it and gradually more and more, each day we're getting positive responses and, and, and they're catching on. All right, I'll go to Daisy, Jonathan now. Uh, can you, I believe you can hear me. Yes, I can. Great. Now, the needs of a special needs child at this time is unique. How would you define the key needs of a special child when it comes to a learning? And why is e-learning not enough? Um, e-learning e e is especially not enough. And, and that's because when we talk about special needs, we're talking about children with different you know, needs, different abilities. So planning one program, you know, as a program that fits all, you know, would definitely have its challenges. So basically, we're talking when we're saying e-learning, virtual learning, we focus more on children with neurodevelopmental disorders like, you know, autism, you know, like um, ADHD and all of that. But again, we also have those who have comorbid disorders. I have a child in my school who is, you know, autistic and blind, you know, you know, like legally blind. You know, and then we have quite a lot of them with, you know, a lot of other impairments that might make it difficult for them to access even the, you know, the, the virtual classrooms, the e-learning platforms, and even assistive technologies. Because when we're mentioning the assistive technologies, they're different technologies meant for different children, meant for different needs, and working with them, you know, at the basis where they are. 
again, we have a concern, you know, as parents, we're concerned basically with the fact that a lot of parents have not received the trainings. You know, even children with, with you know, your typical children, a lot of their parents are struggling, you know, with using technology. And then, you know, you have this, this woman who is alone, who doesn't perhaps have, you know, the support system, who does not have appropriate training, appropriate education, and then she has to you know, manage challenging behaviors. She has to manage, you know, sometimes comorbidities. And then she also has to manage a child to go through a, a virtual classroom. Mm -hmm. So e-learning certainly is not enough, especially where the, you know, the parent, because we must always take our minds off the fact that, you know, we're dealing with parents, you know, who have a certain level of affluence. You also have, you know, parents of children with special needs who are not educated, who do not have the phones needed for, you know, for technology, and right. who do not actually have, you know, even an environment, a setting Sorry, you know, that will be good you enough for, for their children to learn. All right, great. Now, let's talk about the community aspect. And this is for you, Modupe. Now, they say okay. it takes a whole village to raise a child. Uh, what are we saying in this regard when it comes to the special needs child? Well, a village. I, I, I'm, I'm saying village in inverted in, in, in parentheses. Okay. In the case of a village, it's everybody. Um, when you break it down, you have the immediate family, the extended family, the schools, the neighborhood where you live in. And in terms of here, when you take the children out, places of worship, the government, that, that is what is called the whole village. It's everybody. And in this environment, how much are we exposed to special needs children? How much is everybody exposed to special needs children? So it's about everybody being involved. It's about everybody being aware of what a special needs child is all about taking care of a special needs child, what is there for them, mm -hmm. what support, what help, what is available for them and the parents as well. So the village is everybody, everybody concerned. All right. You mentioned the government there. So let me go to Dotson Akonde. Um, to look at the aspect, the government aspect of this matter. Now, we celebrated the passing of the disability bill only last year. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can All right. Hear you very well. Now, what, what are the wins of this bill so far when it comes to implementation? Yeah. Um, well, for, for us, in that field, we know that um, implementation is difficult. A lot of um, things that the government has put in place to support families with special needs is um, it comes down to implementation. How far have they been able to implement that um, bill? What has come out of it is different. What we can see from this time of COVID-19 is that at least we know that the government has data. How do I know that? They came to Patrick to say that we have something for your parents because you are on, in our data, you are on our database. So data gathering is of vital importance mm. when it comes to families with special needs. And for the government, I want to break it down. Their responsibility to families. It's important that the government know that a lot of families are struggling at this time. Many families will lose their jobs. Many won't be able to afford services. Many won't be able to even have three square meals. So there needs to be like a subsidy that is arranged for families at this time. They, I mean, everybody is giving palliatives out there. What happens after everybody, when everybody comes back? Our children are vulnerable. They can't go out. We are scared that they, they might not even be able to tolerate the face mask. So the government needs to come in to subsidize to, for these families, seek them out, find out what their needs are and support them. For the teachers, there needs to be a curriculum in the new um, MCE that takes care of teletherapy. We are all throwing ourselves into teletherapy now. A lot of our staff don't have the skills. We have to foot the bill for training to help them gain the skills. The government can come in and say, how can we help you centers? How can we, can we do a training that will accommodate everybody? Every platform I'm on, I see a lot of things going on with uh, mainstream children. There is absolutely nothing for special needs children. And then when you say special needs to everybody looks at the blind, the deaf, the physically disabled, they forget that they are individuals with intellectual disabilities. The government needs also to decongest those, um, the 41 inclusive schools that they claim that they have. Decongest it. Make this uh, classroom uh, available. We are talking of social distancing. How can we teach social distancing in a class where you have 30 children with various disabilities, and only one teacher and one support. 
they need to you know walk the talk a lot of people they talk about it all the time but the implementation is really really rather painful and for this time it's particularly painful because a lot of us have to go through um maintaining our centers at various schools i run a special needs center i don't have mainstream children so i'm totally out of work because all my children are at home so what happens to the center? The government needs to come in and say, oh, how can we support you? Maybe make grants available to people, to, to the parents, to be able to assess facilities, assess services. So these are the areas that we think the government can come in. And right. it's, a lot, it's a lot of work. And they can also include the private sector. They can call us together as a team and say, come, what are you guys going through? How can we help you? How can we support you? All in right. terms of capacity building. Okay, let, let me move now to Daisy, Jonathan, if you can hear me, Daisy there. Yes, you would agree that the, the, the government, we are asking so much of the government. Well, maybe not so much, but the government needs to do so much more, as it were. Now, how has this system failed uh, these people who fall into the category of special needs, in your opinion? <laughs> Did you get my question? Should I take it again? I'm afraid we can. Daisy, can you hear me? Okay. This, how the government is able to will be able to mitigate, you know, the the needs that we have at this time, the impact of the school closures. Um, yes, the system has failed, you know, parents quite a lot. Basically, like um, Joto has said, there's actually no planning. No one has, you know, sat down to say, what do we really do, you know, with the children with special needs and their families? Um, as we begin the gradual, you know, easing off of the lockdown, parents have to go to work. What, what happens, you know, with the children? We do not have respite facilities. There are no care centers. There are no... It is where the student and the that nature, you know, the few that exist are quite expensive and it's not quite, you know, it's not affordable for parents. So we feel certainly that the system has failed us. The same failed us quite, you know, um, in the areas of prov provision of right resources, provision of the right curriculum, provision of training. You know, trainings like the two has also said, you know, trainings have not been done properly, schools have not been trained, um, you know, therapies are there, they do not have the training, and then it almost falls on the, you know, the centers to, you know, carry on these expensive trainings. So I think we need to get the government, I don't know how that will be possible, but look again, and then look at the family structure. A question I've asked myself is, for the parents who feels all, you know, depressed, all tired, all, you know, feels like giving up, I run a, um, a support group and the parent sends me a message to say she feels like killing herself and her child because you know there's nothing to eat there's nowhere to go and for parents like that who do they go to what happened to our social security system what happened to our social workers you know, all hands need to be all right. Uh, I'm afraid that's all we can take now. Uh, I want to really thank you, ladies. If you can hear me, thank you, Bolanle Adewole there. Thank you, uh, Daisy Jonathan. Thank you, Dotu Akonde. And thank you, Modupe Odefa, for your time. And do stay safe, you all. Thank you.